Okay, I think we'll get started. Um, thanks for coming out tonight, everyone. Um, here in uh, where I am in Echo Bay, it's still raining a little bit and pretty dreary evening. So it's a good night to uh, be inside warm and uh, learn about bats. So just to get started, um, for those of you who may not be familiar with the Kensington Conservancy, my name is Carter Dorsch and I am the Executive Director. We're a land trust based in the St. Joseph Channel area and our goal is to protect ecologically sensitive land um, by creating nature preserves in the area. We currently have um, just over 900 acres of protected property. That's home to well over 1,100 different species that we found so far and uh, tons of shoreline, wetlands and great wildlife habitat. We also do a lot of community outreach projects like the one we're gonna be learning about tonight. So um, just before we get started here, I'm just gonna get turn everyone's video off just to make sure things go smoothly. And then uh, at the end, you can uh, turn your video back on and unmute yourself for any questions. So without further ado, I'd like to pass this over to um, Kareen Wilkerson, who is TKC's Land Stewardship Coordinator. She's gonna be presenting tonight. So take it away, Kareen. Okay, thanks, Carter. Yeah, so as Carter said, I'm Green. I'm the Land Stewardship Coordinator at TKC. And I want to thank you all for joining us tonight on this kind of snowy, blustery day. And I'm excited to tell you about our um, bat monitoring and education program that we're launching. So first I'm going to give you a little background about uh, bats here in Ontario, the bats that we have. So there are eight species of bats in Ontario. Yeah, I've got them all uh, pictured here. We have the hoary bat, the eastern red bat, the silver haired bat, up top in the middle, the big brown bat, and the tricolored bat, the little brown myotis or little brown bat, and the northern long eared myotis, and the eastern small footed myotis. So there's eight species of bats here in Ontario, but there's about 18 bat species in all of Canada. And bats belong to the taxonomic group Chioptera, which means hand wing. Um, and they're only mammals with the ability to fly. Bats are often misunderstood and there's a lot of misconceptions of them and people are sometimes afraid of bats um, and tend to drive them away if they're around their homes. But bats are harmless animals and they play a very important role in our ecosystems. Um, all of our bats here in Canada are insectivores, meaning they eat insects. Um, and about 70% of the bats around the world are insectivores, but there's also some that are pollinators and some that are frugivorous, which means they eat fruit and they play an important role in seed dispersal. So, Three of the bats that we have here in Ontario are migratory. So these bats uh, migrate down south in the winter time. Um, depending on the species, some go to the southern US, the Caribbean or Mexico. These bats tend to have longer wings, which give them better um, lift for flight than um, the bats that stick around here in the winter. And we can find these bats in open areas such as the edges of forests and Anywhere where there's a, there tends to be a water source nearby as well. So you can see our migratory bats are the hoary bat, the eastern red bat, and the silver hair bat. So the other five species of bats are non-migratory or often called cave dwelling bats. <clears throat> so in October, November, these bats move to hibernation roosts, which we called hibernacula, if you're familiar with that term. And these sites are often found in abandoned mines or natural caves. These hibernation sites have very high humidity and they're very cold, but just above freezing. And bats do something um, during this time. They decrease their heart rate and their body temperature significantly in order to survive over the winter. And because of these adaptations, they're able to survive, not only to survive, and they, they live off their fat reserves. Uh, over the winter, they'll, wait, they'll wake up about once a month or so to urinate and uh, rehydrate. But there's a downside to that. Waking up 
requires a huge amount of energy and because they must warm up their body to um, just above freezing in a very short period of time. And a single arousal can uh, consume up their fat reserves and represent a huge loss of energy for them. So keep that in mind, oh, something I'll talk about later. So another um, aspect of these uh, cave dwelling bats is that they're, they tend to be found in more closed environments. So you might find them more in the forest or in urban areas. And they have shorter rounded wings, which are better for maneuver, maneuverability around these types of areas. So just a little brief life history uh, cycle of bats throughout the season. So as I mentioned before, in the fall uh, is when reproduction and migration take place. So for the, the uh, cave dwelling, non-migratory uh, bats, they tend to start congregating uh, near their hibernation site. So they'll, they'll kind of swarm together, they call it swarming, and that is when the bats will mate. And migrating bats will start migrating south. And so then winter comes along and that's a hibernation stage. So our bats, some of the bats will remain in their hibernation roosts and the migratory bats will remain in their warm wintering ground stone. So come spring is gestation. So they're gonna start emerging from hibernation. And usually this is timed with when insects also emerge. And a neat thing about bats is that they have delayed ovulation and fertilization. So while mating took place in the fall, the actual like fertilization of the eggs occurs in spring. So it gets delayed over the winter. It's kind of in holding pattern over the winter. So um, eggs are fertilized and then are gestated anywhere from 40 to 100 days, depending on the species. And then come summer, um, the bats congregate into maternity colonies where they birth their young and the young are born anywhere between May and July, again, depending on the species, with a litter of one to four pups, again, depending on the species. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about why bats are important to us. So bats perform a number of important roles in our natural environment. And some of the benefits that bats provide include um, that they consume large quantities of insects. They are the main predator of nocturnal insects. So that includes moths, mosquitoes, and flies, and all kinds of other insects as well. They help to control the insect population because they consume such large quantities of insects. And on average, an individual bat can consume up to 600 insects in one hour and can eat the equivalent of its own weight in one night. So because they are such uh, excellent insectivores, they help control our insect populations and thereby act as a natural insecticide. <clears throat> so it's, this is an ecological service that is provided by bats and can really decrease the damage um, to crops and things like that from insect pests. Bats have been shown to reduce the amount of pest insect larvae and things like corn crops, and then will increase corn yields without having to use any chemicals or anything like that. <clears throat> Another uh, benefit of bats is that their feces, which is called guano, can be used as fertilizer because of its high content of nitrogen and phosphorus. <clears throat> so those are the great things about bats, but bats face quite a few threats. Um, one of the big threats is habitat loss and fragmentation, which is a threat to many animals in our environment. <clears throat> Another threat is disturbances in their hibernacula. Their bats are incredibly sensitive um, over the winter. And it, as I mentioned before, if they're woken up at all during the winter, it could really affect their survival. Another threat is removing bats from a maternal colony. So again, this is with the misconceptions about bats, people often don't want them around their homes, but those bats all congregating uh, that you might find congregated are probably a maternal colony about to give birth to young bats. Um, another threat is the use of pesticides. Um, 
if these are used, then the bat, uh, the bats will, if they're pesticides and insecticides, the bats will consume and then be affected by those chemicals in their, in their own body, affect their survival. Wind turbines are another threat. Um, they can, they can be uh, disturbed. So it's important to have mitigating measures to assist with the, with keeping bats kind of away from the wind turbines. And then there's white nose syndrome. I don't know if anyone's heard of this, but this is by far the greatest threat that we have to bats in most of North America. And I'm gonna talk about that next. So all five cave dwelling bats in Ontario are affected by white nose syndrome. So here I have a picture of a bat that is affected by white nose syndrome. It has, you can see there's kind of a fuzzy growth on, uh, on its nose there. So this is a fun of an infection that's caused by a microscopic fungus and it develops exclusively in hibernacula during winter. This fungus was introduced from Europe to a tourist cave near New York back in 2006. This fungus thrives in cold environments, cold, the cold and humid environment in caves where bats hibernate. <clears throat> so during hibernation, what happens is the bats lower their body temperature and suppress their immune system. Well, if that fungus is present, they're, they become very susceptible to it. And then the fungus grows on hibernating bats and it affects their wing tissue and their muzzle, as you can see here in the picture. And all, the other thing that this uh, fungus does is it causes the bat to wake up more frequently during hibernation and therefore they use up their fat reserves. So this is a huge issue with their survival. If they wake up too many times in the winter, they won't have any reserves left to survive. So white nose syndrome was discovered in Ontario in 2010. And the presence of white nose syndrome in general can cause a mortality of 90 to 100% of populations of cave dwelling bats. And in Ontario in particular, the little brown myotis has, uh, that bat species has been severely affected by white nose syndrome. So partially because of white nose syndrome, we have four endangered bat species here in Ontario. Uh, we've got the little brown myotis, the northern long-eared myotis, the tricolored bat, and the eastern small-footed bat. Uh, four, three of these were, are listed under COSUIC, which is the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada. And the other, the, the last one, the eastern small-footed Myotis is listed, all four plus the eastern small footed myotis is listed under CACERO, which is the Committee of Status, Committee on the Status of Species of Risk in Ontario. So again, the, the declines are significantly due to white nose syndrome. Um, from what I could read about bats, like not all of the bat species are even um, adequately assessed just because there's not enough data on them. So these are the only ones that have been really, that have enough information to assess and they've been assessed as um, endangered. The other, the other bat species are not on the list, but it doesn't mean that they don't have their own, their own risks and threats um, facing them. Okay, so now that I've given you a little bit of information and then background about bats, I'm going to start talking about our bat monitoring project. So why is TKC monitoring for bats? Well, there's a huge data gap in bat information in the Algoma region. I have a map here that's taken from iNaturalist. So this, um, the outline here in yellow shows the Algoma region. And down here, these little um, red squares indicate where there are bat, bat observations in iNaturalist. There is only 10 bat observations in iNaturalist for bats. And, and I, if, you ever, if you're familiar with iNaturalist, 
it has thousands and thousands and thousands of observations on it uh, of all different kinds of species. So bats are really, really underrepresented. Um, so there are also very few scientific studies on bats in Northern Ontario. I was trying to look up some literature and I really couldn't find much information at all. There's a huge data gap here. Um, so with this monitoring project, we will be providing a first step in determining just at the very least the presence and absence of which bat species are here and their associated habitats. Um, this will be an important tool to assess the presence of bat species at risk as well. So we'll be able to know their, whether we have any of our endangered bats up in this area. So how do we monitor for bats? First, it understands, you have to understand a little something about echolocation. So echolocation is the strategy used by bats to navigate and characterize elements of their environment. In order to echolocate, most bats produce a high frequency ultrasonic sound by contracting their larynx or voice box. And by producing these sound waves and listening to the echoes that result, bats can move and hunt in the dark. And different bat species emit a unique echolocation frequency. So keep that in mind as I talk about the next slide. So because each bat species emits a different echolocation frequency, we can use specialized recording devices to help us detect and identify bats. These devices monitor bat activity by detecting high frequency ultrasonic vocalizations from nearby bats. And then each individual bat species has a unique vocalization and is characterized by its duration, its frequency, and its shape. And I'm going to show you a picture of that in a second. Um, it's that information that's uh, taken in by these monitors is then identified, use, it's uh, analyzed using a specialized computer software, and that can be visualized in what's called a sonogram, which I'm gonna show you in the next slide. But first I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about these devices, which are pretty neat. Um, the green one here called the Song Meter Mini Bat Ultrasonic Recorder, it's called, an, it's considered an unattended device. So these are left in the field to record bat vocalizations over a period of time. So we can set these up, say, at the beginning of the season, leave them out there all season. Well, probably check on them here and there and make sure they're recording okay. Um, and then we bring them back into the office, download all the information, and then we'll do the analysis using the specialized software. It's called Kaleidoscope, and it has a special program in it called Bat Auto ID. So it will be able to identify all the different... Um, unique sonograms created by uh, the vocaliz bat vocalizations it recorded. The other device here, shown uh, attached to a smartphone here, is called the Echometer Touch 2 Pro. So this is something that needs to be used with an, with an observer present. So um, the little device here at the top, it's a little red, um, pretty high tech, piece of equipment, it attaches into a smartphone or a tablet, and you stand outside and it will record bat vocalizations as bats fly overhead. Um, and then the software, you download the software onto your smartphone through an app, and it will identify bat species in real time, at, like as they're going by. So it's pretty neat, and it's going to be really neat uh, to do outreach with this, to go out kind of looking for bats in the evening and we'll be able to identify them in real time as they're flying over. So I'm uh, excited to tell you that uh, we were approved for funding to purchase some of these devices. Um, and uh, we're very thankful to uh, Evolution for providing funding for us to purchase this. And also, we also received a grant from TD Friends of the Environment to purchase some of this equipment. So here, I want to show you, this is just to show you a sonogram. Well, this is a bunch of sonograms kind of put together just to show you the different, how different bat species 
have a unique uh, have a unique sonogram that can be identified using the software. So each is distinguished by its duration, frequency, and shape. So on your y-axis, we've got the frequency. And along x-axis, we have the time. So just to give you one example, um, like the small-footed bat and the tricolor bat, the little brown bat, like they're kind of in the higher frequency areas. And something like the hoary bat is in a lower frequency. And then you can see like the different length of time that their vocalization lasts. So say the hoary bat, it extends a longer period of time, whereas a small footed bat, it's a very quick vocalization. That just gives you some idea of kind of what, what these monitors are recording and, and analyzing for us. So another aspect of this BAT program that we have is community science and education. So on top of having BAT monitors out in the field, we also um, want you to report your BAT sightings. So we've got, um, we've got um, things set up on our website now to report a BAT sighting, report a BAT roost location, conduct a colony count, and another way you can get involved is to volunteer for the actual bat monitoring um, in, uh, on our preserves. Other ways that you can help out is to install a bat house on your own property or participate in one of our bat outreach events. So we're going to be doing more events as the season rolls on and we'll let you know as, as those come up. So I just want to talk to you a little bit about reporting a bat sighting. <clears throat> So you could report it directly to us. I've got my email there, um, just the date, time, location. And if you can figure out the species, great. If not, just, just let us know that you saw a bat or, or more than one, the number. If you have a photo, that'd be great. Um, so you can just email me the, directly the information or you could put it on our website. We have a reporting form on there. That's just a fill in the blank. It's very easy to do. And if we're able to verify your observations, we'll submit them into iNaturalist, uh, which will in turn also be submitted to BatWatch. It's called Neighborhood BatWatch. It's a, it's a North American um, bat observation uh, conservation group that also tracks uh, bat populations. So another way that you could help out with this is to report a bat roost. So you might have bats roosting on your property. So if you have, or you might have a bat house. So if you have a bat house or bats roosting somewhere else on your property and you're aware of where the location is, we'd ask you to report it to us, that would be great. So a roost is any place that a wild bat uses for shelter or protection. There are many places where you can find bats roosting, including in buildings like cabins, barns, abandoned houses, sheds, warehouse, or you might even find them in tree crevices, under bark, under bridges, mines, they, any little space, they might find a place to roost. So I've set up a uh, bat roost location um, fillable form as well on our website. I believe I've put a picture of it here, yeah. So this is what the form looks like. So, I mean, you could fill in the form or you could email me and I can help you do it. I'd be happy to do that. Um, but this way, we would have a record of where our, bat roosts are, where our bats are roosting. And then we might be able to, you know, if you're interested, we could, we could try out one of our, uh, our handheld monitors and, and see if we can identify some of the bats coming out and or we could do colony count. So that's the next step. If you know where bats are roosting, we can try to count the number of bats using the roost site. So this is generally done in the evening, about a half hour before sunset, as the bats exit their roost site to feed. So it's very, um, very simple to do colony count. You just, you see these people in the picture here, they're just 
sitting near this bat house and they're just waiting to watch the bats come out. So as they exit, you're counting the number of bats. Uh, we're not really looking this at uh, the species necessarily, but if you're able to know what they are, that's great. If not, um, just looking at numbers of bats that come out. So another way that you can help out with the uh, bats around our area is to install a bat house. So the Kensington Conservancy received a generous donation of four 300 chamber bat houses. Um, they, came, they were given to us by the Sioux Naturalists, but they received them from the Gooley Wind Farm. Uh, this spring, we'll be setting up these bat houses on TKC preserves, and we will we plan to set up one of the bat houses at the Kensington Conservation Center so that the public can easily view it. So installing a bat house on your own property will attract bats to the area and provide them with a safe and long lasting summer home. The added benefit to you is that bats provide excellent mosquito control and they consume, because they will consume a very large quantity of them. And if you have a colony of bats on your property, a bat house can help you to relocate them to a better spot. Maybe if you don't really want them in your shed or garage or something like that, if you provide a, a bat house, um, they, will, they will likely relocate. Um, there's sort of some protocols to follow to help them to do that. But if that's something you're interested in doing, you just let me know and I can help you out with that. Um, there's plenty of resources online with instructions on how to construct your own bat houses or you can purchase one already made from a, a reputable supplier. So the ones that we received actually look like this one in the picture. Uh, they came from this uh, company called CanadianBathHouses.com. And it's quite actually quite a large bat house. I'm quite excited to get them put up. So another way you can help out with our program is to pa participate in one of our outreach events that'll be, and we'll let you know as they're coming up, but we're planning to do more webinars about bats, um, hoping we will be installing our, our bat houses. So we will be looking for assistance with that. Um, maybe if we're able to uh, set up some kind of a workshop about bat house building, we'll see if we're able to set that up this season, if not next year. And we're hoping to do some colony counts. So once we find out where bats are roosting, um, this would be a great opportunity to do a colony count. And as you can see in this picture, there's a nice little group of people here waiting um, to do a colony count. And then bat week comes up in October uh, of this year. So we will, be planning some activities for that as well. So another way to get involved is now that we have our bat monitoring equipment, we're looking for volunteers to assist with this project. Um, one thing would be to assist with installing the actual bat houses and also to deploy and monitor the bat recording devices. Um, from time to time, they would also need to be checked and check, change out the SD cards, check batteries, things like that. I should mention that um, we're planning to put these devices, I'm hoping to purchase at least five. I might have enough funding for seven. Um, they will go on our preserves Definitely one at the conservation, Kensington Conservation Center, the Black Hole Preserve, the Ripple Rock Preserve, Stoby Creek, and Archibald Preserve. And if we have additional recording devices, we will might do duplicate on some of the larger preserves, or we might choose another area to set them up. So outside of the our our own. Uh, project and activities, um, there are other ways you can help out bats. One is to protect and conserve forested zones that border bodies of water as those are the ideal habitats for bats. 
they like to be near kind of that forest edge open area with a water source nearby. Don't visit caves inhabited by bats during the winter. As I talked about, they're so sensitive while they're hibernating and could really disrupt their ability to survive. Also, don't remove or disrupt maternal colonies. As I said, that that's um, when the bats get together to birth their young. Often, some of the species of bats only give birth to one pup per season. So they're very limited. So if they're disturbed, they, they may not uh, reproduce that year. Another way to help is to install a bat house, as I mentioned previously, and try to avoid using pesticides and insecticides as bats feed on insects and they're highly susceptible to the effects of pesticides. So pesticides not only reduce the availability of insect prey for bats, but can also cause sickness or death if bats ingest contaminated, contaminated insects. These products are stored in the fatty tissues of bats and the body assimilates them during hibernation. So they have been found in the breast milk of bats and both migratory and non-migratory bats uh, are susceptible to the negative effects of insecticides. And here, use mitigation strategies around turbine, wind turbines. So in particular, um, migratory species are at most risk when it comes to wind turbines. They can cause death to bats through direct collisions, but also due to pressure changes as bats fly through them. Um, but there are mitigating strategies to, to uh, help bats to avoid these areas. So you've got to keep that in mind as well. And of course, to participate in TKC's Bat Monitoring Education Program as a volunteer or as a community science partner, helping us to report bat sightings, bat roosts, and do colony counts. So I really do want to thank um, Evolution for, I know that some partners from Evolution are on the webinar tonight, so I really do want to say thank you for um, providing the opportunity to purchase our bat reporting equipment. Uh, we're really excited about this project and getting that set up. So we want to thank you so much and of course to TD Friends of the Environment Foundation as well who uh, recently uh, approved our funding proposal for this program as well. So um, special thanks to both of these groups for supporting this project. And feel, this is our contact information. So feel free to contact us anytime if you wanna get involved with our BAT monitoring program. So I'll leave it there and thank you so much. Um, if anyone has any questions, I will open the floor to that now, unless Carter wants to add something before we do that. Oh, thank you, Corinne. I actually learned a whole lot myself, so that was great. <laughs> and I didn't know a whole lot about the biology of bats, so that's great to learn a little bit about it. So, but yeah, if anyone else has any questions, Feel free to unmute yourself, turn your video on, and ask away. Or, or put it into the chat, too. Hi, Corinne. That was great. Thank you. Um, I have a bat house at Twin Lakes on the island, and I, I never see anything going in and out, but maybe I'm not looking at the right time. So <laughs> we'll have to try the half hour before sunset. Yeah. Um, <laughs> my question is... Um, what bat is the most prominent in our area here, um, east of the Sioux? Well, that's a good question, Sherry, because uh, we have a huge data gap. So in terms of official observations, um, on iNaturalist, there's 10 observations for bats and there's only seven of them are actual um, species specific. There's three that are just bat, bat in general um, and they're equally distributed. So 
I, I can't really answer that. I mean, there's probably someone anecdotally that could maybe might know I, more I, about that, but. I think big brown bat and little brown bat are generally the most common ones. Yeah. But I, I'm not 100% sure on that. Well, I'm going to watch what, my bad house and I'll let you know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And, and you know, that's, that's why we're doing this so that we can find that out. You know, what's, what is most prevalent around here? So. Okay. Thank you. Thank we you have one question. question chat here. Where can I get a template to build bat houses? Okay. Well, maybe I will look into that information for you and I'll post something to go along with that. Um, that's a good question. I did come across something recently. Uh, so I will look at that again. And I'll, I'll post something for you. Okay. Another question from the chat is, do bat houses require units? We have a couple of them up um, years ago just as white nose, nose syndrome hit and they've never been occupied. Is there anything I should do now? Um, as far as I know, they don't require much maintenance, although if it might be worth cleaning That's it out. Um, but if it's never been occupied, probably not. I mean, the other option it would be to try to find another location for it. I mean, I know there are specific um, there's specific advice as to which direction, like how much sun, uh, how much warmth it gets throughout the day and things like that. So, you know, south facing versus north facing, I could try to find those specifics um, to help you if you wanted to maybe try to relocate it or angle it differently. It maybe it would help. But I can try to find some more re resources about bat houses in particular that we could post uh, on our on our website with our bat program. That'd be great. Um, Don, you have a question? Uh, just a comment, actually. Uh, partial answer to Sherry's question. I have the advantage of being really old. <laughs> and I, it, within my memory, no doubt the little brown bat was by far the most common in Algoma. I think maybe 90% of the bats we saw in the old days were little brown bats. But now I don't see bats much anymore at all. And I'm sure that's because of white nose syndrome. It's made a huge, huge impact on our populations. And that's easy to see if you've been around for a long time. Yeah, I would say I've even noticed that since I've lived in the area. Like when I moved here in 2007, I remember seeing bats in the evening flying around all the time. We had bats roosting in our siding. <laughs> and mm, over the last few years, I haven't seen barely any activity. It's, it's upsetting. There's such a drop in populations. It's really mm. dramatic. We couldn't sit outside at our fire pit 10 years ago. The bats would come and swoop at you all the time. Mm -hmm. And I can say in the last seven, eight years, you wouldn't see one at all. And I saw my first one last summer and I was thrilled, but I only saw one. Yeah. So maybe they are starting to come back. Yes, same here. I, I see maybe one or two a summer and that's it. And it certainly wasn't like that as you say, 10 or 20 years ago. Um, Jonathan, do you have a question? Uh, I have some comments and questions. Okay. <laughs> um, so I work with Miss Malve Cree uh, Business Corp, and I know the First Nation will also be doing that monitoring up in the Miss Malve Cree territory oh, north wow. of Chaplo. Um, so that's my reason for joining. Um, and we do need to connect <laughs> um, um, we like I don't know exactly when they're gonna start but this summer um, they're they're planning on it so um, either if we could get some our hands on some devices as well um, I know they have funding and stuff too so they have plans 
to get some stuff. But yeah, we could totally um, submit information um, for you for like the whole North region. Yeah, this is great. Yeah, we'll have to, we'll definitely get in touch and we'll talk to each other about that. Thank you yeah. for that information. That's great to know. Um, any other questions? Carter, Michelle, I'm moving. Carter? Hi, Sue. Hi. I have a question. Okay. When you have a bad house and they move in, how do they hibernate? Is it not too cold when they just live in the bad house? I'll let uh, Kareen answer that. But yeah. <laughs> the bad house generally is a summer roosting site. They will they'll find another place to hibernate, I believe. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh my God. Okay. Well, I don't think there's any more questions, but if you think of anything afterwards, definitely uh, feel free to um, reach out to Kareen or myself. Oh, one quick uh, question here. Do they migrate south then? Um, I think... Um, you missed that, Lee, at the beginning. We, um, Kareen did go over which species migrate south and which ones over winter. I think there was three that migrate and eight that uh, hibernate locally. So um, when you get the link sent around afterwards of the recording, you can catch up on that um, beginning part there to see which species were the ones that migrated and which ones stayed here. So, um, yeah, as I said, if there's any follow-up questions, just reach out. And uh, if not... Uh, We'll uh, hopefully see you out volunteering with us um, for the bat project or anything else. But so uh, have a good night, everyone. Thanks everyone. And thanks for joining us. And let me know if you wanna get involved or have any questions, anything like that. Thanks so much. Well, uh, once we get this uploaded to YouTube, we'll send around a link to everyone um, with the link to that. So you can watch it again if necessary and with a little more information about bat houses.